so I'll probably have to repeat a lot of this next week. Um, what I brought you guys today is just a selection from the Book of Enoch having to do with Judgment Day. Because, um, can I go ahead and erase this? Go ahead. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Sure. I, That's one of the big things the Book of Enoch is Judgment Day. Well, okay. So I wanted this to kind of flow from what we've been talking about. Um, all this time I've kind of been laying the groundwork and leading up to this. And so basically all the roads were leading to this. Um, <clears throat> we talked about how in the, in the New Testament, um, the idea was that Jude brought up the book of Enoch, quoted him exactly. Um, Jude 14 and 15 quotes Enoch 1 9, which basically says, And behold, he cometh with ten thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all, and to destroy all the ungodly, and to convict all flesh of all the works of their ungodliness which they have ungodly committed, and of all the hard things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So Jude quotes that quote. So it's not just one nine that he quotes, all right? Um, he quotes several other sections as well, and also the Assumption of Moses. And so what we find and what we've surmised here is that in early Christianity, we talked about there was sort of a Enochian uh, vein, if you will, to Judaism. And you see this witnessed among the, the Dead Sea Scrolls community, for example. So the scholars know all about this. The uh, theologians know all about this. It's their business to know they know. But there's things like traditions and what has gone before and stuff, and things that limit us and things that limit our thinking. Um, so this book was basically banned and, and, and spoken against um, throughout history, and it basically disappeared, at least from what we call, you know, the Western world or our, our Christianity, but it was always a thing in Ethiopia. But apparently people didn't like that because there were two schools of thought. There was the whole, like, go back to Moses kind of thing. Moses, the original lawgiver, everything's focused entirely upon that. And there's people who go back further, back to the patriarchal times, or not the patriarchal, I mean the, the antediluvian times, right? So the idea is that there were people, there were questions about this book. People just had questions, right? You know, Jude didn't just quote Enoch 1 9. He made he made commentary on Enoch 1 9, right? He cites the source, right? Right? He says the book in Enoch also. So he mentions it by name. Right, Enoch also, he again, he says it's old. He gives it its antiquity. And, of course, it's authenticity because, of course, he's the seventh from Adam, right? Right, from Adam. So, in other words, he's saying that this is genuinely, in his opinion, genuinely ancient, right? And, again, it doesn't matter whether scholars believe it or not. It doesn't matter whether Christians believe it or not. It only really matters whether Jude believes this and makes this assertion, right? Um, he says he's the seventh man. He prophesied, so he's a prophet, right? So he, because he prophesied, right? About what? About these men. So it's relevant, right? It's relevant to his time, right? Of these men. Now, what are these men doing, right? These men are infiltrating the church. There's certain men crept in unawares who were before of old, right, um, spoken of. So we talked about, and then, of course, he gives the quote, of course. But the, it's important to notice that, the, that it's, these, are, these are conscious decisions, or else at least spiritual decisions. These are decisions made by the Holy Spirit. Because all scripture is breathed by the Holy Spirit. And for someone who is a basic Christian, they can't come out openly and deny the canon. They can't really openly deny Jude, although they come very close to that. They come, they, 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 they speak in sort of, uh, 
you know, deceptive kind of speech. They say things like, well, just because he quotes this doesn't mean he thinks it's a, the whole book is authentic and, and yada, 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 right? Kind of ignoring the fact that he sort of gives a blanket approval of the book by mentioning it, right? That he gives it its antiquity, that he says that it's prophet, prophecy and that it's relevant to the men of his time, right? And then, of course, it speaks of the end times, right? He speaks of this very quote is that it has to do with the end of the age, right? By saying, you know, the quote, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. So it's, it's relevant all the way from his time, right, to the coming of the Lord, right? And so what was evident was that this book here was brought before Peter with these questions, right? Like, what, what is it about this book? I mean, like, he, he, Jude makes a claim that this was something that the apostles taught. Right? And Peter, of course, is an apostle, right? Uh, the chief apostle, some people say. Well, you know, whatever. Uh, but in any case, uh, he's definitely somebody who was promised the keys of the kingdom of heaven, right? So whatever he binds uh, in, in, uh, on earth is bound in heaven, and whatever he looses in heaven is loosed on the earth, right? So in other words... It's, it's kind of akin to the way we talk about in the, in the book of Revelation, where it says, He that openeth and no man shutteth, and he that shutteth and no man openeth, right? So what, is, what, is, what were some of the questions that were brought to Peter, right? They brought certain questions to Peter, obviously, because Peter provides certain answers, right? He says, for example, when we told you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, right, which is Enoch 1.9, Right, we were not following his cleverly concocted fables. All right, so one of the questions is most likely is this book just a cleverly concocted fable? Because he answers that question. Uh, also, one of the questions probably asked uh, of Peter was, is this um, uh, is this actually prophetic? Is it actually you know, ancient, because the, one of the answers that he gives is that prophets of old, right, spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So they were not fables, and that the prophets of old spoke by the Spirit. By the Holy Spirit. Right? So, in other words, people must have been asking Peter, is this genuine and is this spiritual? Were these people? You know what I'm saying? That must have been the questions, either explicit or implicit, because Peter gives those answers. So, focusing on the term of old here, where are they getting this term from? Well, this term actually comes from the book of Enoch itself. Um, let me, hang on a second. Yeah, here we go. So starting with the parables, right, um, which is chapter 37, it starts out, the second vision which he saw, the vision of wisdom, which Enoch the son of Jared, the son of Mahalalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, again, the seventh from Adam, right, saw. So he's affirming what Enoch is saying about himself or what is being said about Enoch. Right? And it says, and this is the beginning of the words of wisdom, which I lifted up my voice to speak and say to those who dwell on the earth. That is to say their focus is on earthly interpretation, earthly understanding, you know, scholarship and tradition and that kind of thing. You know, the words of men, that which is derived from man. Um, but notice the, notice the term words of wisdom here in 37, what is that, 2? Okay, in, um, in Enoch, what is this, chapter 99, there's another mention of the words of wisdom. Um, it says in verse 10, it says, But in those days, blessed are all they who accept the words of wisdom and understand them. 
and observe the path of the Most High, and walk in his path of righteousness, and become not godless with the godless, for they shall be saved. So, this apparently is the title that he's given to his own work. These are the words of wisdom, or the words of the wisdom of Enoch, or whatever. Um, which he lifted up his voice to speak and say to those who dwell on the earth. And this is the interesting part. It says, Hear, ye men of old time. Right? So he speaks of the men of old, right? Hear, ye men of old time. Right? And see, okay, so here, and then see, ye who come after, right? Right? So the, the, the book is given to an early generation and to a subsequent generation based on that. Um, it says, Hear ye that come after the words of the Holy One, which I will speak before the Lord of the Spirits. It were better to declare them only to the men of old time, again, antediluvian times. Right? It was, it was better just to, to give it to them, but apparently they didn't repent because if, if Peter, or no, sorry, if Peter says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness, but he was the eighth man in the ark, in other words, right, that means that what, for whatever he was preaching, whatever, whatever he was saying to the people, apparently none of them um, were invited or none of them wanted to go on to the ark. Um, but it says, um, yeah, so it would better to declare them only to the men of old time. Like, in other words, it would have been better if they had repented, right? But apparently nobody repented because Noah and his family were the only ones saved. Um, but even from those who come after, we will not withhold the beginning of wisdom. So this is the beginning of wisdom. And this is sort of echoed in Peter's way of speaking, uh, because he says, knowing this first, right, beginning, first, right, that men, the, the prophets of old um, were, did not speak by the will of man, but they spoke by the Holy Spirit. So the most fundamental thing is to understand the spiritual nature and the spiritual origin of this book. And what we see is that Jude asks people to fight for the faith which was once and for all. In other words, it was supposed to have been a permanent feature of our teaching. To fight for the faith that was once for all delivered unto the saints. Right? And then so with all of these questions, this is brought before Peter, ostensibly out of unbelief. I mean, presumably anyway, because... Why would you bring these questions? Is it a fable? Is it actually inspired by the Holy Spirit? Is it actually of old? Right? So people had these questions. Peter gave these answers. So you have, you have Jude, one writer of the New Testament, something that everybody's supposed to believe, citing the source, saying it's ancient, saying it's prophetic, saying that it pertains to the men of his age, because again, those are they who come after, right? Um, and then he gives the long quote, right? So you understand that the book itself is all the way until the end times. And the terms of old or whatever that Peter uses in declaring that, um, that the world of old was the antediluvian world, as we've spoken of so many times before, um, that's borne out um, in this book. So those concepts... If you go by the Bible logic, and again, I'm not asking unbelievers to believe or whatever, you know, you can see these things. They don't have anything to do with whether you believe them or not. They are objective features that exist within literature that is thousands of years old and that exists to our day. So you can call it what you like. You can think of it, make of it, whatever you like, but that's the reality of it. So... The idea is the book starts out like this. The words of the blessing of Enoch 
wherewith he blessed the elect and righteous who will be living in the day of tribulation. Again, those are those who come after, right? When all the wicked and the godless are to be removed. So, and that's, uh, these are all the sections that I picked out. There are others, so too. This there is are some. Uh, your condensed version of Book of Enoch. It's a selection. a selection. Because remember, we talked about how there were books. There were books of. Um, the, the dream visions and the astrological stuff, you know, the heavenly luminaries. Right. There was a book of Noah. There was a book of the watchers and all that. All of that stuff is something that you can get into. But this, th these, are, th these are basically words that are directed towards those who are living at the end of the age. This is, a, this is basically his words to the uh, people who will be living on that day, which is this day, right? Because we talked about how there were seven days, right? And we already know that 6,000 years have passed, right? At least according to biblical chronology. So we're living here on this seventh day, right? Which, of course, is the day of tribulation, right? So... This is a book of instruction across time to those who will be living in the day of tribulation. When all the wicked and the godless sort of be removed. And he took up his parable and said, Enoch, a righteous man whose eyes were opened by God, saw the vision of the Holy One in the heavens, which the angels showed me. And from them I heard everything, and from them I understood as I saw. But not for this generation, but for a remote one, which is for to come. So in other words, it was, it was written in, during the antediluvian period, the seventh from Adam. To be understood on the day of tribulation, right? So, in other words, this is going from all the way from before Moses, before Abraham, before any of that stuff. Our origins trace back before, you know, um, well, before Hebrews. I mean, the the Semites were subsequent to that. So, in other words, this is what he's what the Bible is telling us is that this is the original teaching. This is the foundational thing. This is the, um, the, the most important thing to, to grasp, uh, is, that, is that everything stems from this understanding and not the subsequent understanding that, um, that men have come up with. Um, and I'll just read on a little bit here. The Holy Great One will come forth from His dwelling, and the Eternal God will tread upon the earth, even on Mount Sinai, and appear from His camp, and appear in the strength of His might from the heaven of heavens, and all shall be smitten with fear, and the watchers shall quake. Um, you know, it's funny how James says that the, the demons believe also and tremble, right? I don't know if that's an illusion to Enoch here, but it's, it's certainly echoed here that, um, that this scripture existed before James was written, obviously. Uh, the idea is that they fear this day of judgment because they know that their downfall is written in the book of Enoch. And above all... They wanted to avoid this ending because um, right now, like what I was saying about Jude and Peter, is that, you know, in the mouths of two or three witnesses shall all things be established. And how many times does God have to say something in order for it to be true? Once. You know, and, and that's exactly right. So, in other words, all you have to do, all you have to do is believe him because he said it. But he said it in so many ways and underscored it in so many ways that you can clearly see that people who don't believe it and don't go with it are clearly negating it. Uh, they're negating the, the notion that Enoch is the seventh from Adam when they say that he's not. They're negating the idea that prophets of old time, again, antediluvian ages or whatever, weren't inspired. That they were, that they were cleverly concocted fables. You see how this is injecting the poison of unbelief into our belief system. And if Enoch is foundational, then that means that everything that, that denies and negates Enoch from that foundation is an unstable foundation. And that's another recurring theme, theme that you will find in the book of Enoch. Um, let me see if I can find it here. Um, just a second. There's some actual... Um, Oh, yeah, okay, so here, 
this is one example of where it says it. It actually says this in quite a number of places. Um, where are we at? Um, uh, so I'm looking at Enoch right now, Enoch 99. 99. Verse 99. 9, I guess. Well, let me back up. Let me, let me, let me back up to... Um, Well, let me back up to, to verse 8. It says, They shall become godless by reason of the folly of their hearts, and their eyes shall be blinded through the fear of their hearts and through the visions in their dreams. Through these they shall become godless and fearful. Um, for they have wrought all of their work in a lie and have worshipped a stone. Right? We talked about how the, the basis for them negating Enoch, for example, is their questions as to its antiquity, its questions as to its authenticity. And they went forward with the idea that Enoch was not inspired and did not form, did not have any place in our canon or in our um, heritage, right? Even though Jude and Peter uh, went to bat for this book, right? And so when they formed a canon, right, and they left Enoch out of it, right, okay, they built on this foundation without the, the book of Enoch in it, and presumably other books, um, and it says, and so therefore in an instant shall they perish, because once you recognize that the book of Enoch actually is that particular bone of contention, that sort of... Um, how should I say, the, the, the sort of um, thorn in the side, if you will, of um, traditional Judaism, which influenced Christianity to the point where they adopted a canon and went so far as to deny their, um, their own scriptures and to negate their own scriptures on this basic one point. So you can see the test here. You can see the trial, whether you believe God or not. Right, because everything's sort of uh, foundational here. When you understand, well, there is no such thing as a canon, but that these things do pertain to one another. Right, the canon and the books that are mentioned inside of the canon are also valid. Um, with the witnesses that he gave us, it basically forms a pretty airtight argument against the canonizers. So, everything that they taught that was based on this idea, right? which is 2,000 years, right? Right? Everything they taught on that, right, basically gets negated, right? It disappears in an instant. Because once you recognize that, fundamentally they lied. I mean, it started out as a lie. Like when you, when you read the, the, the uh, book of Second Peter, for example, it, it says that it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than to have turned their back on the sacred command that was handed down to them. So it wasn't, it wasn't uh, a mistake or whatever. It, was, uh, it says with this they are willingly ignorant of, for example, that a day is as a thousand years and a thousand years. Are as a day. So he talks about a willing ignorance on their part. They are the people who are willing to um, negate the prophets, if you will, for their own gain, for their own selfish purposes, or even their own private beliefs. You know, he says that the Bible is not for, the scriptures aren't for anyone's private interpretation, right? But prophets of old time, in other words, the antediluvian prophets spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. But then it continues, but in those days, blessed are all they who accept the words of wisdom and understand them. And we talked about that just now. Um, the words of wisdom, which are... Um, his message to us at the end of time, right? And observe the past of the most, paths of the Most High, and walk in the path of His righteousness, and become not godless with the godless, for they shall be saved. And we can see that a path has been laid out for us. If we just take Jude at his word, for example, and we know that Enoch is the prophet, we know that he's ancient, we know that he's not. Uh, you know, uh, some cleverly concocted fable. We understand this from the scriptures if we affirm them. So the path of righteousness clearly is to affirm the scriptures rather than to negate them and to let God be true and every man a liar. And if you do that, then you will see these connections between this book and our canon, right? And all of this leads to the notion that, that the book of Enoch 
is meant to be taken away from us in order to be returned to us on that day, the seventh day, the day of judgment, right? When the wicked and the godless sort of be removed. So in other words, it doesn't come down to us direct, right? It comes to us indirect. And so this is why you see Peter and Jude, their focus is on remembrance, right? Because their mystery is also going to get lost. Their teaching is also going to get lost, right? Until it is returned to us again on that day, right? Um, so the idea is that these two work in tandem, two canonical books. Remember we talked about in the, in the, in the, in the presence of two to three witnesses, right? So we got these two and maybe the third one, if you're inclined to believe it, but it doesn't matter because we got two. So we have this notion that, especially, obviously, this is an apostle, this is a brother of our Lord, the brother of James, right? This is clearly somebody who was well-connected. One can assume that he probably went to, you know, had dinner and, you know, conversations and events and whatnot, you know, with him. They spoke, obviously, from what we know in the Bible, they spoke familiarly with him. You know, they obviously... Um, you know, understood his meaning or whatever. But the idea is that this book is to be returned to us. And all the sections that I picked out for this had to do with the end day and the judgment. And you can see it's sizable. It's like 17 pages just like this. And there's more I could have used. Um, but we'll have to go through this first before we really get too del you know, delve too deep into the watchers. I don't know if we'll get into that at this point. Uh, if we'll get into any of the other sections of the book. But what's important and what's consistent with our understanding here is the way in which these books are literarily linked together in order to create the, um, the conditions, if you will, for this book to be read again in churches and to be understood in the end days, just like it says of itself. So the whole function of this book, again, is to be a, a demonstration of his power and his wisdom. How people regarded these books as foolish and therefore made them of none effect, right? When the Bible actually says that the quote-unquote foolishness of God is wiser than men, right? And that the weakness of God, that is that which has no effect, is stronger than men, right? And this is a demonstration of that because people called it a, you know, essentially a fable, right? And they made it of none effect. And so this is basically God pulling his weight at the, end of, at the end of time. And like I said, we'll go over this in specific, but just to kind of give it a transition here between studying 2 Peter and Jude, studying Revelation, seeing that structure of how the mystery is going to be lost and then restored, you know, how the last will be like the first, etc. And it goes from generation to generation, you see what I'm saying? The idea is that all of these things make sense when they're seen along this framework. So, anyway. guess that's it. <laughs> okay. well, we got a, got a beginning. I'll send this to everybody. I don't want people to miss out. There, I'm going to kind of go over this line by line and section by section, so it may take a while. But just as an overview. Well, there's a lot there. Yeah. yeah. It's a rich subject. All right. So I mentioned, close, close with this. Uh, talking about the canonization of Scripture is actually a, a, a rather late process. And Eusebius in his Ecclesiastical History, right around 325, speaking of the New Testament, he says there's like, a, you have the accepted books, right? Uh, like the four Gospels, things like that, the Epistles of Paul. So then you had what he called the disputed books. Mm -hmm. The interesting thing is like uh, the book of Revelation, Second, Third John, <laughs> like, uh, Jude, and then we have like Clement, um, the Didache, you know, uh, was the Shepherd of Hermes, you know. <laughs> so. Uh, Basically, all, all this this literature, most of it, I have to look at the list he has there. Most of it's accepted, but you know, some of these books which are disputed actually made it into the canon. 
right? And these others didn't, even though most of them are preserved. And then we have what he calls, the, the other group he calls the spurious, the spurious books, you know, which he thinks are like, a, he actually puts the Gospel of Thomas and there are other other uh, books, but uh, uh, I think the skull. Obviously, I think the the Gospel of Thomas has a lot of value. I forget what the other books he put in the spurious listing, but they say that you have the what well, you have the, the the Church Council of uh, we well, have Hippo and Carthage, and this is like three ninety eight, right? So, by the year 400, you still didn't have a, an official canon of scripture, right? So, yeah, 400 yeah. years of the church history, there's not a... The church is... It, it, it's, it's, another thing is like, so Constantine becomes emperor, right? And he doesn't say, you know, they, they have a church council. The church council doesn't say, this is what's... The, you know, they didn't establish a canon either. In fact, uh, if you get... What Constantine did do, you know, is he he converts to Christianity. He doesn't make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. That didn't happen until later. Uh, he he did commission like some luxury, you know, fifty leather bound, you know, uh, uh, Bibles. And we have, I think we have, a, we have a Codex Sinaiticus, and it ha it has Barnabas, uh, and and I think it's got the Shepherd of Hermes in it. <laughs> so. So this Bible includes uh, includes books that, um, in the end, you know, this one of the the oldest versions of the Bible we have has an expanded canon that includes Bibles, uh, books of the Bible, books that were part of the Bible then but were excluded later. So I think that's that's interesting. And of course, the Old Testament. I got uh, I guess it's on the pulpit, but of course the King James the, the King James has its it's so-called apocryphal books in it. Now, I think that's significant. You know, a lot of people be outraged that what King James included First and Second Maccabees and Tobit. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, he did. He thought that you know these books, uh, while disputed, were you know important enough to be included within the Bible. Put them between the Old and New Testament. And you know, actually, Martin Luther did the same thing. And then, uh, you know, on top of that, you know, we have the King James Version Apocrypha, but then the Orthodox have even more books. <laughs> and this is, we're talking about the Old Testament here. Uh, and, of course, in Ethiopia, Enoch is, Enoch's not, you know, a pseudepigraphal or uh, apocryphal. Enoch's always been considered part of the Bible. Uh, it's just, it's, if you get Ethiopian Bible, it's included, um, just like, the book of Daniel, the book of Esther, Joshua, they got uh, Enoch in there. All right.